lecture nine of ECE 2305. And so in this lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, one of the key technologies that is at the center of our information age, which is cellular communications, cellular networks. And what we're going to be talking about in today's lecture, we're not going to talk about 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, all that buzzword stuff, like the, what you see on those like cellular service commercials and stuff. It's like, like, look at this guy's map of service coverage, and then look at this guy, you know, and, and but, you know, don't believe everything they show you on TV, okay? What we're going to look at is sort of the core physics. Oh, yeah, I said physics, but we're not going to look at the math side. We're going to look at how in the world does cellular communications, why is this so powerful? Why is this important? We're going to talk a little bit about the radio propagation effects, because there's physics involved in that. And then finally, we're going to talk about multiple access i.e. accommodating all of us and our cell phones and our wireless needs. So the cellular concept, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there's a lot of talk here, but I'm going to draw in a few minutes what does cellular communications mean, all right? But what it means is that there's one core principle. So here's like a laundry list of what is meant to be called a cell. So there's a cell site, cellular communications, cell phone. What is this cell? OK, so a cell goes on. There's tiling. It has its own antenna, its own frequency range, base station. Adjacent cells avoid frequencies. But what is a cell? So a cell is a region, geographical region, serviced by a base station. And only that base station in that limited range. Then there happens to be another base station right next to that base station, a certain distance away, with its own cell, and the cells don't overlap, or they try very hard not to. Oh, then there's another cell, and then another cell, and another cell. So what cellular communications is all about is this concept called frequency reuse. Otherwise, what ends up happening is we do not have enough channels to support everybody's wireless communication needs. Remember that spectrum map I showed a few weeks ago? And all those blotches and everything is used up, used up, used up. If we did not do cellular reuse, if we did not limit the range of these cell phone frequencies, we would only support maybe 50 cell phones, and that's it, all over the world. But what we do is we play this little trick. So right now, like, you know, if, if I were, like, if let's say, we choose five people in the room and say, OK, tell me how, how, how was your weekend, right? And share it with the, uh, and, sh and you know, start sharing it with the rest of the class. There will be noise. Nobody would be able to be able to understand each other, right? So if I ask Dan to talk about his weekend, I talk about my weekend. Um, maybe James about his weekend. Uh, I'm trying to find somebody else, somebody else. Maybe Julia about her weekend. What happens is, if you guys start talking, and you don't regulate your power, the amplitude of your voice, what happens is everyone overlaps, everyone interferes, no one's communicating, it's all noise. Now, suppose, wh what happens in the real world? Let's say, talk to the people nearest to you. So I would say that circle of folks there, will, you'll be talking to then, right? So you'll be talking really quietly. So people in the back, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, OK, I talk loud, so. So, so I can't avoid that. I'm a loud talker. And then James, you're a circle. Julie, you're a circle. Like each one of you guys have a circle, right? And so that's very similar to cellular reuse. And then the base stations. Let's say that Julia has information for Dan. You would then share it by some other maybe wired network or maybe some point-to-point -point wireless network that's separate to the cellular network. So what cell, cell sites do so I'm just going to go straight to the drawing, OK? <laughs> I can't wait. I want to draw. So what happens is the following. First of all, and you'll see this everywhere, cellular communications, usually a cell, symbolically, is drawn like a hexagon. And then you have the other cell here. You have another cell here. You have another cell here, and so on. So everyone gets, gets my drift, right? So each one of these cell sites is serviced by something called a base station, or BS for short. Ah, good question. So base station, 
base station. Good question. So base station. And we usually refer to a cell phone as either um, a mobile or sometimes, especially in LTE, which we'll talk about next class, um, something called the user equipment or UE. User equipment. So what this does is that the base station will only transmit enough power to only reach the perimeter of its dedicated self. And otherwise, um, the power beyond that is so weak that you can say, OK, I can't hear you. It's effectively like in the noise, right? But this base station, on the other hand, will be able to service that region, not serviced by this base station. So what effectively we're doing is we have these multiple wireless access points, these, all these BSs located servicing um, complementary but non-overlapping geographical areas. So this base station would be accommodating, would be providing cellular service to these mobiles, these user equipments. This base station would be providing cellular service to these guys and so on. And what's interesting is that each one of these base stations, it, well, OK, let, let me take it back. Each one of these base stations, if you're adjacent to one another, they would be, they would be operating across non-overlapping um, non frequency channels. So the reason is there's still a risk at the boundaries. It's always the boundaries. There's always a risk that if, let's say, I'm talking with this guy over here on some frequency, and let's say there's a guy over here, and this base, base station uses the exact same frequency, this is bad. Because what happens if there's just a little too much radiation going over, now I'm hearing the other base station in addition to the, guy, the base station I want to talk with. So that's interference. So what I want to do is I engineer my cellular network of these base stations such that they have non, uh, they, they have a complementary set of frequencies. So this guy, oh, hey, what's going on? <laughs> uh, okay, so keep. Let's go back. So what happens is this guy here might have a, uh, a, a set of frequencies, okay, F1. This guy here might have a set of frequencies F2. And what happens is F1 has nothing in common with F2, right? So that way, even at the edges, they don't interfere because they have non-similar channels that they're using. So let's say this guy here now is operating on, on channel F1, and now this guy's F2, and they're far enough away from each other, they're not going to interfere. Same thing here. This base station might have non-overlapping frequencies with this base station and that base station. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to engineer this network to have different sets of frequencies being supported by each one of these base stations. In the end, nobody overlaps with each other at the edges. It's possible. It's, um, hang on, there's a mathematical term for it. But, but, in, uh, but honestly, what ends up happening is we avoid this um, interference between cells. Yes? So you can have two sets of frequencies for cells that aren't adjacent to each other. I don't know if the one set of frequencies are like, not adjacent to each other. Exactly. So, so like what happens is, let's say we have 20, 30, 40 different frequency channels, right? What we do is we choose a pattern of frequencies, uh, cha uh, frequency channels that, let's say, are allocated to one cell. And then we figure out, like, you know, we have six cells that surround it, and we make sure that they, are allo they, they have an allocation of different cells, uh, uh, frequency channels that do not interfere with that guy, as well as with each other. And then another cell, two cells away, might reuse those exact same frequencies, and we do that over and over and over again. Because the goal is, the goal is 
essentially, we do not want adjacent guys to talk on top of each other. Yes? Area codes is, um, that's a good question. So area codes um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a sort of a legacy from um, blah, 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 from landlines. So what happens is if you look at your telephone, every telephone that you call, um, you, the, the first three are your area code, and that describes a geographical region. Then you have, I think it's called the exchange, so the next three digits. So for instance, uh, UMass Med is 334. Um, WPI is 831, and then, and then the last four digits should be unique to the phone that you're, you're calling to. So that's a little bit different. This is on, on the idea of like the actual frequency channel, but in the, in the old days, in, in order to like route like a landline telephone call, and, and that's why cell phones nowadays, they use as a legacy these landline phone numbers. But, but, uh, like, but if you go to, let's say, AT&T, and you say, I want a new phone, so what type of area code do you want? Um, give me Cambridge. I think it's cool. 617. No, seriously, when I, got, when I moved here uh, several years ago, it's like, what type of area code do you want? Because I was in Kansas. So Kansas, eastern Kansas was 785, and it's like, it's kind of a bummer, and people say, oh, Kansas, that must be Wiglinski. So, uh, so I went to 508. Bad thing is, my, my cell phone number, I'm not going to give the last four digits because I don't want people saying, oh, Professor, what's going to be on the test today? Um, is uh, 508... Uh, three, th three, four, four, and then blah, 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 right? And so I went with that because 508 is Worcester, Western Mass, all of this. Bad thing is that notice I said UMass Med is 508-334. So I don't know why, but I must be the oncology department half the time. So <laughs> that's why I never answer my phone. It's like, suspicious number must be oncology. Number of times I get x-ray reports. Anyways, question. So this goes a little bit more into the architecture, but the way it works, so several things. So what happens is, so first of all, you have the base station. When you turn on your cell phone, it goes through the process. First, your operating system on your cell phone boots up, right? The first thing it's going to do is it's going to do something called polling. It's going to like, at not maximum power, but pretty loud. First of all, it's going to, it's going to pick up who's the nearest base station in my area. So, so, so usually distance of a base station, usually you want to choose the nearest one. So theoretically, should have the largest signal strength. There are exceptions, but usually you attach yourself to the one with the strongest signal strength because the base station will always send out a beacon saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Then what's going to end up happening is the cell phone's going to transmit saying to the base station, hey, I'm here too. And what's going to happen is the base station's like, oh, what's your identification? And this depends on what standard. Like, with LTE, um, there's a bunch of like these uh, temp uh, there's a bunch of identification numbers that actually get exchanged in order to authenticate it and make it join the network. But but what it does is then ever ever so often after you connect with the base station, it's going to pull again and say I'm still here. Okay, noted. You're still here. And all your cell phones do that. That way, your base station knows that you're part of the network. What happens is if you walk, if you're mobile and you go now closer to another base station, you do something called handoff. So what's going to happen is your cell phone will be passed over. You're going to join another cell because now you're closer to it and become part of its cellular network. And it's going to tell you, now you should be on this frequency. So, so there's a predefined joining process. But then afterwards, um, afterwards it's going to say you're on this frequency. Or it gets a little bit more complicated. But yeah, basically. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cell phone tower, it could be like in a, in a really compact form. Um, let's say you have a femto cell. So let's say in your apartment, you can have, let, let's say, um, some sort of Verizon femto cell, provides you cellular access, as well as Wi-Fi and all these other things. It's probably going to be connected by Fios and the like. So it can be small. It could be temporary, like they call them cows. I forgot what it stands for. So in uh, both of uh, President Obama's inaugurations, there, were, there was not enough cell phone towers to provide service for all the one million folks in the, in the mall, the National Mall. So what they did is they put tel, uh, temporary cell phone towers to provide coverage for everyone. That's cellular reuse at, like, at the max. So basically every 100 feet cell phone tower, cell phone service area, cell phone service area. Ah, so they, they engineer 
the, 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 so there's macro cell, and they, they re-engineer it saying, avoid this subset of frequencies and allocate it to the cows. That's a great question. Yes? Yeah, they would have to negotiate themselves as well, like who can use at what time. And there are other tricks as well, which I'm going to talk about. Last question. So is it quick enough, like if you were in a call and you went to a different area, that it would take you When it works well, yes. When you're driving at 75 miles per hour and it's an older technology, not so much. That's why if you're driving, you're on the mass pike, and then all of a sudden you're transitioning and dropped call. That's what's happening. You're basically not switching fast enough, and you're dropped, and you get upset, and then you call, say, oh, sell your network. I'm going to switch networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yes? Would the same thing happen if you're driving across the edge of the cell? Yes, because what happens is you're kind of at the very perimeter of the service site. Exactly. So what happens is if you're playing here, or here, or here, or here, and you're, uh, or worse yet, like you're in a complicated area, where you bounce between the two service areas, the, the two cells, that's a big problem. That's a lot of complexity on your cell phone, on the two cells, and uh, that's actually where there's a lot of money to be made in order to fix that problem. That's all, okay. Okay. So, this guy, these base stations are all over the place. And like, you know, what Regina mentioned, um, that this is what we call a macro cell. So this is over macro, sorry, I was going to say macroscopic, macro cell. And then inside, if you have some unique needs, you can have cells in cells. And we call those micro cells. There's also pico cells and there's femto cells. Femto cells usually the size of an apartment or small power of an apartment block. Um, uh, pico cells maybe over a courtyard in like a, a, let's say, a restaurant or a mall area. A micro cell might be a little bit larger. And then macro cells can range from anything from, say, um, part of a, you know, like let's say one or two miles in any which direction here um, to, let's say, if you're in Namibia, like Professor Luft, when he was advising IQPs there, he saw in the distance like a cell phone tower. And then he saw the tiny little human being. It was like a speck of dust. and that that cell phone tower was easily like 100 feet tall. I can't even imagine what the cell service site was. And th what you might ask is, how many people are in it? Because the, re the size of your cell is determined by how many people are being serviced. In Namibia, in the desert there, maybe there's 10 people at most. So you can have a cell that's tens of miles in all directions, right? One cell. Downtown, downtown Manhattan, you're going to have to maximally cut everything down to the femto cell level, like every 10 to 15 feet, cell, 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 cell. Because if you have like a density, like anybody been to New York in rush hour, like, you know, walking down, like, you know, it's amazing. It's just a sea of people. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, I went to grocery shopping, and then afterwards I bought this, and blah, 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 blah. And if you have hundreds of people down one block, and that's just one block, and we're talking a mile. You know, Manhattan is how many miles, right? That, you're going to have to really, really be intelligent on how you cut up your geographical areas. And, you know, this has been a problem for about 15, 20 years. People have been working on this for 20 years. When I started my master's, the problems we were talking about then, and one of the technologies, how do you, how do you try and maximize your service coverage? Well, there's a trick. Like, let's say I want to maximize all the channels. What I can use in a cell is I can reuse. I can reuse the same channels in three, in, in thirds of my cell. What I can do is, let's say I use channels 1 through 10 here, channels 1 through 10 here, and channels 1 through 10 here. And how do you accomplish that? It's something called sectoring. So I can take a third a third, and a third, and say, your channel two, your channel two, your channel two. How do you achieve that? You use antennas. You use multiple antennas arranged in a way, and this is where the high school physics works, that it's only directional in this third, and that third, and that third. So like, look at, look at the smokestack right next to Boynton Hall. You're going to see six of these uh, reddish boxes on top. One pair 
is one sector of Worcester. Another pair is another sector for Worcester. And another pair, like, let me draw it. So you're going to have something that looks like this. You're going to have a long box-like thing and a bunch of wires, a box-like thing, a bunch of wires, a box-like thing, a box-like thing, and then here's going to be a couple more boxes. These two boxes will service 120 degrees of the 360 degrees azimuth of Worcester. So right now we have a sector of 120 degrees servicing your Verizon cell phones. You're going to have another sector of 120 degrees servicing over there, like, you know, the UMass Med folks. And then another 120 degrees servicing the Elm Park area. And so that uses multiple antennas that, when you phase them right, will be very directional. And there are a few other techniques. Right? So you can do cell splitting, that's what I just showed, where you can break it down into smaller and smaller cells within cells. That also, we have microcells, like for instance, those cows. I'll find out what the acronym stands for. It's a really cool, like, why do they call them cows? Yes, Thomas? Um, do you think the living, like, smaller than a macro? Yep. How can you just, like, Uh, no, 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 because those macros, like, so cells and cells, like all those base stations are all connected to the same wired network. So it's almost like the nice thing about cells, as opposed to Wi-Fi, is everyone's coordinated. Oh, you got that uh, cell phone user? Cool, tag, you're it. And nobody else touches him. And what happens is everybody's, it's this really, really intricate game of tag. And one of those levels, one of those base stations is playing is going to be handling a cell phone user. So mobile radio, on the other hand, so you can imagine that there's a lot of fun stuff happening in, in terms of, like, you know, when you're driving, when you're walking. In this building, it's, it's fantastic. But one of the things that we want to avoid is interference and noise. And then on top of that, there's this nasty thing called fading. So fading is kind of an interesting concept. What fading is all about is essentially when we have several copies of your same signal, your signal, bouncing off the walls and everything, and they're intercepted, like let's say by your cell phone, and they destructively combine. And that's bad news. Because what ends up happening is, because of the physics like reflection, my signal bounces off the chalkboard, my signal bounces off the ceiling, off of the desk, off of all these guys, at a single point here, they might all destructively combine, all those reflections. Here, oh, they're amplified. I can hear them perfectly. Diffraction, let's say what happens is the signal somehow hits the edge of a surface and then bends down, and it gets picked up. And then scattering, the signal scatters around where the antenna is located. So what happens is we have this mess. It's not like a wire. Each signal comes in this big glob of copies that are delayed and out of phase with each other and then get added together. And that's just awful because that affects signal quality. In addition to noise, in addition to interference. So fading, let me, and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Or a day, whichever you want to call it. So what ends up happening is you have, oh, you have the transmitter. You have the receiver. And what ends up happening is you have this guy. You have a few objects around the receiver. Whatever copy of the signal, because remember, the wireless energy goes all over the place. You have scatters. You also have objects along the way. And so what ends up happening is at the receiver, you're seeing all this gobbledygook coming in out of phase, out of time sync, some of it's going to constructively combine, and some of it's going to destructively combine. And so what you might experience, what you might experience is things like fast fading, especially if you're moving, slow fading, like let's say the environment changes slowly, your amp the distortion, the attenuation that your, the, the combination happens will actually change slowly. Flat fading, all the frequencies get attenuated the same amount. And then 
selective fading, some frequencies get knocked out, others are not touched all that much. And we'll talk a little bit about this later, but then we need to figure out how we're going to handle multiple users. So um, we'll talk about this tomorrow, um, but there are things like FDMA, TDMA, and CDMA. So that concludes lecture nine. Ooh. Cool. I think I'm going to put in a